In part one, we saw how to modify our function that drew stacks of ellipses to draw different kinds of images. Now, let's look at using functions again to make the program even shorter and more flexible. Here's our program where we left it at the end of part one. Notice that what DrawStack is doing is the same thing, almost the same thing, three times. It's creating a fill color and then drawing an ellipse. The only thing that distinguishes one pair of fill and ellipse from the next pair of fill and ellipse from the next pair of fill and ellipse are these floating point numbers. In the one case, I'm using a number to scale the color. And in the other case, I'm using the number to scale the size of the ellipse. Well, if I'm doing the same thing over and over, but it only varies by choice of number, that's a perfect place for a function. So let's create a function. So now the question is, do you write the function and then call it, or do you invent calls and then write the function. It all depends sort of on intuitively how well you can anticipate where you're going with this. Right now, I don't know exactly where I'm going, so I'll write the function first. So it doesn't return anything, at least I don't think so yet. If I decide it does, I'll change that. I know it needs everything that DrawStack needs, so I'm just going to copy these arguments and paste them in. A comma, because I know I need two more arguments. I need, I'm going to tab out so that my arguments are all lined up. I know I need a color scale and I know I need an ellipse scale. And again, I'm trying to keep my variable names short so that they'll all fit on the screen. I would usually spell those things out. And those numbers are going to control the size of the ellipse and how dark the color is. So I'll tell you what, let's see if we can flesh this out. And processing is trying to help me with those tabs. I know that draw ellipse is going to have to pull the color apart into its RGBs, and then it's going to fill with a new value and draw an ellipse. Let's copy the red, green, blue code. I'll just paste it in here. And then I'm going to copy one of these fill and ellipse calls. Then let's paste those in too. Now I know that the color is going to be changed by this color scale. So I'll just copy and paste that into all three color scale slots, and then the size of the ellipse is controlled by ellipse scale. And now I'm done with draw ellipse. So let's go back up to draw stack and call draw ellipse. So first thing I'll do is I'll say draw ellipse, and I know it takes all these arguments as inputs. And then my first ellipse is going to be, let's go back to our original idea, so that the first ellipse has full brightness, so the brightness is multiplied by one, and the ellipse is multiplied by one. Now let's draw a smaller ellipse inside of it. CX, CY with height, color. Now how much should we multiply the color by? Now let's do our original scheme first. So we'll multiply the color by 0.8 and we'll multiply the size of the ellipse by 0.8. And then finally, CX, CY with height, color. Now it's the innermost ellipse. And just as we did before, we'll use 0.6 and 0.6. Now, all this other stuff I can get rid of. In a lot of ways, this is a cleaner program. Let's run this and make sure it still does what we think it should do. Whoops, I have an error, and that's because I've copied the dot in there. And it looks like I did it in E scale too. So we'll get rid of those and run the program. Beautiful, just what we started with. So, in a, as I said, in a lot of ways, this is cleaner because Draw stack. Now we, if we look at draw stack, we can see, oh, it draws three ellipses. An ellipse is pretty clear. It says pull apart the red, green, blue, fill by some scale value of it, and then draw the ellipse of some value. So tell you what, let's make the center ellipse very small, the way we did before. I only have to change that one number, and there it is. And let's flip the colors around. So let's make the outermost color say 0.5 and then the middle color 75 and we'll scale the innermost color by one so that the colors get brighter as they work their way in. And we can do all kinds of crazy things now. Let's make these things very close to each other. I'll tell you what, let's make them so close that they're very nearly together. And now we get this kind of um, 
darkening effect at the edges. If you wanted to make these really smooth, you might need 20 or 30 of these little things. And we will see how to do that when we talk about loops. But if you were really super motivated to make 20 or 30 of these things, you could. You would just need 20 or 30 calls to draw lips, and then each one of your stacks would have a nice, big, smooth ramp on the outside. To see the value of a routine that returns a number, let's take a look at this little program. I'll run it for you so you can see what it does. It draws a box in the middle of the screen, a circle in the middle of the box, and an orange disc is moving down and to the right. Suppose that this is a game, and we're trying to get that orange ball right on top of the black dot. And so we're going to score it based on how far it is from the black dot. Let's take a look at the code. The first few lines of setup are nothing interesting. We call size and smooth. Draw is also not very interesting. I set up a background color. Then I make a light blue color and fill a rectangle. That's the big background box. I fill and draw an ellipse. That's the circle in the middle. I find the X and Y center of the ball by using frame count. I just picked a few numbers and it seemed to move nice and smoothly on my machine and that was good enough for me. I fill with a nice orange color and I draw an ellipse centered at the X and Y I just computed. Now I wanna get a score. Well, I don't know what that's gonna look like, so let's just sort of make stuff up. I'm going to say float score equals what? Well, something. So I'm going to call a function called get score, which I haven't written yet. And I know all get score cares about is the center of the orange ball. And it will give me back a score, something. It'll give me back some floating point number. And we'll print that out. Well, that's a start, um, but it doesn't do anything interesting yet because we don't have get score yet. If I try to run this now, we'll get an error. Processing is telling us the function get score, which takes two floats, does not exist. Well, yeah, right, we haven't written it yet. So let's write that. So we're going to write get score. We know it's going to return a float. So we put that at the start and we know it takes two variables, the ellipse center X and the ellipse center Y. In fact, let's, those, those names are even too cryptic. Let's just call it PX and PY. It doesn't care that they're an ellipse or anything. It just says I have a point X and Y. Just to make sure we get everything working, let's just return the value five. So the score will always be five, but at least we'll see if everything is working. So we'll run the program and sure enough, there it is. Score equals five over and over and over. The score is always five. But now let's make the score something interesting. Let's say that the score should be something that depends on PX and PY. So I'll create a variable, which I'll call ball score. And I will make it the distance of PX from the middle of the screen plus the distance of PY from the middle of the screen. That's the horizontal middle and the vertical middle. And I'll return that. It's not the world's greatest score, but it does have the advantage that when the ball is right in the middle of the screen, it's zero. And as the ball is further away from the middle, <laughs> it's larger. It's gonna get negative, it's gonna get positive, but it'll be bigger the further away the ball is. So when we run this, we find that sure enough, the scores are large and negative. When the ball crosses the middle of the screen, they're zero, and then they get bigger and bigger and bigger again as the ball goes further away. Now, you might think this, this is a lousy scoring function, and I would agree with you. But the beauty of it is, now what's happening inside of score is completely independent of what's happening inside of draw. We can sit here and tune up the scoring procedure all day, trying out different little formulas and trying out all kinds of different little ways of scoring, but the main program doesn't care. It has been isolated from the process of computing a score. You'll find that by breaking things up this way, you have an enormous amount of flexibility in the composition and imagery and dynamics of the pieces you create because if there's some little piece of things that isn't working right, that's probably contained in its own function. And you can just manipulate that little bit of things independently of the rest until it feels just right.